Hello everyone, today we talk about 15th century Europe in Outlook. Um, this is an age that, after all, we haven't um, observed a lot, right? We tend it always to be in, but in the heart of the Middle Ages, 15th century is, is peculiar in many ways. Uh, we studied for, you know, in many ways sim more similarly to, to what we do with modern history than with the average medieval uh, one uh, the same goes a bit like for the early Middle Ages. We tend to, you know, to to approximate it, especially the very first centuries to to the ancient world, methodologically speaking. But it's objectively a very important century, probably also uh, an overlooked one, uh, especially in terms of the mm, social, political, and institutional development that today we will partly address. We will come back in general this century as well, aside from naturally going in depth to it at the same time uh, because this broader view of properly you know late medieval europe and especially it's um you know the the, the areas where the, the the greatest developments were were being achieved um is something that as we've seen also elsewhere will significantly mark fundamentally much of the uh of the modern age itself right in, until properly the fall of the ancien regime it was caused um all at, at the same at the same time, uh, and it is to be read. Um, this is what I care about because I realized recently that there is some bias regarding to such interpretation that uh, about the end of the Middle Ages, the humanism, Renaissance, there's properly nothing uh, progressive in a democratic sense as we could uh, think. It, right? You know, we have we have to get acquainted properly to this fact that you know it doesn't matter how much. Um, improvement uh, there is um, in absolute terms in a society, right? The still the uh, the degree of control by by a, a very narrow elite, etc., can you know can essentially uh, prevent uh, the exercise of some uh, freedoms uh, compared to you know society that's maybe is poorer on average, but maybe has uh, an absolute higher uh, degree of, of freedom. In, uh, in in society, this doesn't actually. This goes a bit against what I usually make the point of when I talk about the Middle Ages. That is to say, say that properly the elites made things work, right? And this is true as well, right? Uh, the elites are there because they are true elites. In many ways, in spite you know, communities are always dysfunctional by certain standards, right? The problem is not much even the individual freedom proper, but the way these societies are organized and what they can achieve altogether, right? And what we see with the 15th century is not the gradual emancipation of people, of freedom, absolutely none of that, right? The Middle Ages ends with properly the lock to political participation, in what we know as, in, as the Ancien Regime, and it doesn't matter whether it was an, an objective improvement at some level, so that is not so, so obvious or so you know, um, narrowly measur measurable at a, you know, when you look at this, a single details, but that uh, overall kept, um, you know, happening uh, throughout this time. Um, I say this because there is somewhat a narrative that what eventually would happen in Europe with the Reformation, with, you know, the rise of, you know, more national, national states in a sense, not nation states like in the contemporary era but let's say the idea that universalism we made a video about this the end of universalism since especially the 14th century it's not coincidence there um here was being somewhat uh, eroded right um we can't say it was lost uh we can't say it was uh, however uh, you know still intact in, in itself it was actually undergoing a severe crisis that eventually the rise of you know, various countries would c correspond to. And this reflects, again, not much of a progressive development of, you know, civilization altogether, but it's rather the consequence of a crisis that had struck the system since the, the mid-14th century, uh, at least in, a, you know, in an overwhelming way, and from which Europe was naturally recovering on a more territorial base than it had been the universalistic one, let's say, of, of the previous centuries. These interpretations are somewhat controversial uh, because you could say this and it's opposite by depending on the standards that you take in con consideration. But I, you know, beg you to remind that definitely 
uh, it's not because some statal entities, uh, like especially especially national entities, emerged, or you know um, some you know greater religious autonomy existed at a you know community level, but at certain levels, just you know that there was a lot of democratization of the process. That there were still fundamentally certain communities that were freer than before, but they were still controlling ever more tightly an enormous amount of people, right? As it, it hadn't been previously the case, right? Um, this is not just... Uh, this could just be the history of properly, you know, banal, if you've studied from, from a political point of view, what what's the rise at this point? Of, in fact, of monarchies, of principalities, right? Not of republics um, in the, you know... If you look at properly at the average of Europe, right, there are exceptions to this, but they remain as such there to confirm the rule. And still, the masses, the overwhelming majority of people living in the countryside were ever more detached in the modern age from the control of the state, right, the participation to political activity. They, uh, this process had happened, in fact, in the last two centuries of the Middle Ages, violently. By the 15th century, this system was already there. In, in place, right? The, the the major repressions had taken uh, place um, in the, in fact, in the mid 14th, in the second half of the 14th century. The 15th century sees certain important movements of uh, revolt, but not a rebellion. Think about the Bohemians, the Hussites. Um, think about what Tyler John Ball. But if you know what the story went like there, you can see, yes. It's being, it's being read progressively because look at these guys unchained, but how did the thing end, right? In both cases, you know, Bohemia basically went destroyed, it lost one third of its population because of all the wars, etc. Yes, what what was really achieved? We we were looking the air. It lost its uh, political independence fundamentally, passed under the Habsburgs in the same 15th century, and uh, basically there was just a narrow. The the, the world result of re revolution was the, the affirmation uh, of a. Uh, an even narrower elite, right, properly in terms of, of concentration of power uh, than before. Uh, in England, also, the thing went, you know, uh, it was repressed brutally. So the, there are s certain, re even the Swiss Confederacy that had won its independence and uh, in the previous census, whatever, but it, by the, the 16th century, is, is in decline already, right, as a, you know, uh, as a, as a, international bloc that, that never properly aimed at having a greater, you know, uh, to become an empire or anything, but still they were fundamentally surpassed by other systems. Um, and uh, the great winners here are, as the, are the great state builders that are the most uh, elitistic and stratified societies, right? And that fundamentally uh, reflect this order that the ancien regime had established. Another point to properly understand, in fact, is the diversity of this system, right? Europe wasn't all alike. We, that's uh, something that I know uh, I insist on, uh, and it may be somewhat antipathetic by certain standards, because I know that lots of people look at the Middle Ages um, and popular culture, and they're attracted to it uh, for essentially you know, abilitating a sort of, you know, pride or identity sense about, you know, their, their past, their ancestors, but there, there was properly, you know, not just a, you know, there was not just a general consideration to make about what, what it was like at the time and why, right, but properly there is, I perceive, a lack of, you know, of interest in admitting also what made civilization at the time. Right, and where the, the main processes took place, right? There are properly certain areas that are more documented that were the lead, right, for the rest of the continent, um, and that yet were different uh, between one another. There are some paradoxes also happening, especially as early 16th century history shows, in a sense, a certain macroscopic dynamics that by, you know, the, the second modern age were still there from, from what they had accumulated like in the Middle Ages, Right, get too specific, but it's important to remember the differences. The Middle Age. I, I give you that. Yes, we're speaking of the Middle Ages. We are looking at uh, naturally a, a m much less diversified society than our own. Right, so it, it's really easy as an approach to say, okay, well, yeah, uh, how different could they be? Whatever. This is probably just medievalist stuff, you know, to to find you know the 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 difference into. 
um, uh, after all, very homogeneous system. Well, mm, relatively so, especially by the 15th century proper, but not only. Uh, and uh, differences are crucial because the more you understand and the more you realize how sometimes, even in, in this apparently you know simple systems, that weren't simple at all. Um, you know, small differences could happen like and why, right? And therefore, concentrating on saying, oh, wow, so is this how much, it, this is didactic, right? How much our own society can change as well, considering how dynamic and, you know, uh, more complicated, complex and complicated, even, even more complicated to understand problem, right? So the Middle Ages are a great exercise because they present you with something much more realistic than normally what is the modernistic view of history, I might say maybe contemporaneists do not indulge in these things, but, you know, from, you know, modernistic historiography often has, you know, felt the need to stress this kind of, uh, you know, saddle uniformity that kicks in even, and it's not even a modern history thing, right? That literally is the end of modern history. It's properly the beginning of a contemporary one. And neglected the the incredible and important balance through which the same modern state as we know it uh, emerged from from these realities, um, and uh, it's it's difficult to address. You know what could have been the, the major, uh, you know, the, the major cause, the major ideas that fundamentally brought this kind of developments. By the 15th century, it could be said that um, there was a great discussion, great debate on authority. All right, this derived from the aforementioned 14th century universalis, uh, universalism crisis um, that was, uh, you know, enhanced uh, by between the end of the 14th and the beginning of the 15th century itself by the Great Schism, right? That was, you know, an imminently political problem. And it was reflecting already certain trends that um, will, you know, probably were... Uh, had always been there in a cultural sense and reflected at some levels of politics and society, but that in this gradual process of state building will ever take more, in fact, the face of, uh, especially on this ecclesiastical policy uh, base, the the face of modern Europe and especially the difference between the Catholic and the Protestant world, uh, etc. So, uh, certain dynamics that have actually little or nothing to do with religion in itself, right, uh, as any other single factor, but were the, 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 the result of, you know, a system of them. Um, and um, there were, uh, there was, however, in this process, right, the, the debate about uh, authority, right, and the nature and the sources of the same, um, certain gradually a tendency, as we've seen, towards monarchical or um, princely models, right? Most of Europe at this point, as it would be fundamentally throughout all the modern age as well, was dominated by kingdoms, principalities, however, you know, uh, monarchic, right, or autocratic uh, powers. Albeit, as we will see, it's, it was always a matter of debate, of negotiation, right? Um, there were other systems, as uh, as we've seen, right? Uh, there was, uh, we mentioned before, the Swiss conf uh, Confederation. Uh, we can't look at, I don't know, the Republic of Venice, right? We mentioned already Bohemia, uh, the strong movement towards a wider form of uh, popular participation, which doesn't mean that the people actually uh, ruled as such, but that fundamentally there were some, you know, uh, representatives of 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 commoners, right, which is a different thing still, because still the people were somewhat segmented, they were, these were still elite in, in their own regard, right. Um, actually, this feeling for popular participation was felt also within the church, uh, already in a sort of uh, pre-reformistic um, instance, but it had always laid at the root of, of ecclesiastical uh, reformism, even throughout the, the same Middle Ages, right. Uh, the Pope at this point was a fundamentally a monarch, like all others. He was at the head of a territorial uh, dominion. Uh, he, you know, had a lot of money, had an army, right? And um, also in this, we should evaluate what it meant properly. Aside from from 
the you know the, the religious or theological point of view what what was the concrete possibility to uh, to organize and administer a church in the 15th century in previous time in later times without such basis right it's almost nonsensical to criticize the church at this point because as an earthly power was fundamentally a monarchy because basically that was standard for any other political entity the same goes for uh, this bias against the church is very heavy like but normally when you talk about the middle ages there's a sense ah you know the oppression of the church the church was actually faring much better by degree of properly juridical administrative political standards internally then because it simply was more centralized was more organized right bureaucracy was born there um uh, inquisition was actually much more guaranteed tribunal than the lay ones but nobody complains about those right uh the same goes for what the people actually believed at the time about the inquisition they were actually fine with that <laughs> you know and that is often not said so never fall into the modernistic prejudice because it's bullshit right modernity is cool is great right but modernism is not right we don't have to um, idolize something just because we came later and we are too stupid or ignorant to understand what it was like before so for us to criticize and make us feel you know emotionally better when we are just morally despicable it has nothing to do with the factuality of history and how these people organized and you know and ruled this world um th that is not to say that it was a good situation to be in compared to our own standards the problem is that those people were much more res directly responsibly uh, responsible and in charge in what we are today for our, our own society so we are very much hypocritical about that because at that time you know civilization had still to go the path to us right and you can blame those people if still that hadn't happened because they are the ones who built it for us in the first place to happen uh, and we just mostly are on somebody else's shoulder in this sense and uh, it's hard right um, human communities do not evolve progressively um, and there is not the good guy that does the good it's mostly basically a series of failures and patches put one over the other for things to improve and it's always bloody, it's always terrifying. And it's under everybody's eyes, even today. Right? Look at how we, we control the world. It's, uh, you know, things are going better, much better than ever before. But fundamentally, we still essentially don't give a damn about most of, most of how it actually concretely happens. So that we say, okay, we, we content with the absolute result, which is a plus, which is... Uh, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't go the other sense. Yes, but how better could you do and you factually didn't to, to have maybe 10 times better what could easily have just because you, you, you there's nothing to, to, to be content just because of an absolute standard considering, when, especially when you put it in perspective at that point. Now, this is another point. Um, there were also certain systems that, albeit very advanced from a political and institutional point of view, uh, could differ very much in, in, in their nature, in their balance. For example, pick the Kingdom of England and the Kingdom of France, right? These in the 15th century, as you know, were still engulfed for at least, you know, the, the first half of it in the Hundred Years' War. France, at some point, could be literally uh, not wiped out, uh, but properly, you know, to be dynastically ruled by uh, by the English, and uh, they they had they were entangled into a set of relationships that you know in broader northwestern European you know, reality uh, had dramatically boosted state building, um, and where in fact England and France are remembered in this case as fundamentally the most advanced monarchies in Europe, right? Not because there weren't elsewhere. Um, also, for example, Castile was doing pretty well, but these were the ones that had somewhat a more orderly and unitary and kind of um, m m institutionalized mystics of, of, of monarchy, but still so much that even the French one that we see, especially, you know, developed ideologically in, in the modern age, etc., was actually an English law, right? Much also happening during the, the Anglo-Burgundian occupation of Paris and certain, you know, aspects of this uh, dynastic struggle. That's another story. Well, how did they differ? Really a lot, right? For example, representation existed in England, whereas in France basically did not, right? There were two completely different, uh, at least, you know, opposite, uh, tendentially, views of what the nature of monarchic power had to be. In England, it, it was f fundamentally mediated, negotiated, uh, you know, limited by 
uh, by the parliament, in France actually the parliament was properly more eager to confer power to, to, to the king. The reasons now we can't explain, we made actually two videos about the political institutional development of the two countries. Uh, England was a country of, of older unity, of greater centralization, it had less centers of power proper, it had, uh, London was a, a, a proper, m properly, a, a more of a capital than Paris had been historically, you know, had an ancient, uh, even, you know, chanceries existed since Anglo-Saxon time, it was something also more compact, England is smaller, right, etc. There were, the, the, this, this is not just a deterministic, England could, could, could crumble at some point, like any other state at this point, uh, because of internal struggle, whatever. Um, if it hadn't been for Edward III, political, military, administrative reforms, we wouldn't properly know the, the role in English history that it, it would eventually reach uh, in the modern age, uh, etc., uh, France was something completely different. Uh, it was a multi-centric um, uh, dominion that encompassed literally different countries altogether. Northern France is another country compared to, to the south. There are certain areas that are properly, um, well, that speak other languages or have properly another uh, identity. Um, it, it was a, a much more uh, decentralized and feudal power in nature. Right, uh, state building had been a great deal in the 13th century. The Hundred Years' War strained that, and the French kings tried to compact it more. They succeeded if, if effectively. But also, as as a much larger country, it felt also because of distribution of wealth within the same country with a very stronger, very strong ability. This sense of properly of of the command of the fact that the king, after all, had to be strong to keep all this thing together. And the Hundred Years' War had proven how crucial that would have been. So to comp to very different experiences. And uh, there were thinkers, like, I don't know, if you take Sir John Fortescue, uh, he criticized the French king's Dominium Regale, as it was called in Latin, uh, you, know, uh, you know, proposing instead the, 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 what he thought was the better English counterpart, as the Dominium Politicum et Regale, this, you know, this uh, negotiation, because, of course, also in England, the royal authority was, you know, uh, conceived at the same level, you know, possibly even more by mystics of monarchy than France at some point. Uh, at least, you know, if, we, if we talk ab about the, the kingdom territorially at large, but by adding the political element here, he was stressing the, the negotiation process with the rest of the communities, right? We don't have to judge on a uh, on a merely comparative standpoint. We have properly to understand, okay, that can help methodologically, excuse me, drink a little. But we have to contextualize why these systems work differently, right? So, for example, representation is crucial. Also, the French parliaments had, you know, uh, were a form of, of representation. It's just that it was much less systematized, much less influent than it was in England. Uh, the, this systems of councils, of assemblies, of various um, stands, etc., were you know, uh, were fundamentally, um, the various estates, excuse me, were present everywhere, right? Uh, medieval, medieval political institutional systems were fundamentally based on this, right? On the idea that there was a set of communities that had their own right to, to say when the king, it was that they namely elected in order to, to defend their own natural right, God-given rights, um, what was good or not. Right. In France, this existed too. Like There wasn't properly an exception in all this. There were certain systems that historically had theorized something more, you know, more radical, um, also properly in terms of monarchic uh, prerogative over the rights of the communities. But also in France, of course, it was believed that uh, the king was there, not because uh, he had just the right to rule on everybody. Absolutely not. It was conceived exactly in the opposite, that he had to defend the community, and in this regard, to properly be functional to, to its safeguard. It's just that in, in, in French political culture, this thing shifted towards a, a much greater support towards monarchy and monarchic power, right? And even in there, there was room for uh, for negotiation, as we will see in a, in, in a while. Um, so whoever thinks that uh, assemblies were somewhat created just to meet the political needs and demands of princes definitely is uh, is not correct historically, right? It was always a negotiation. None of these 
powers was fundamentally independent um, in what it was doing. Uh, no king. Uh, here was a, a, a ferocious struggle just for asking for more contributions, right? And finding the, the justification for that, or the, also probably the political permission to to uh, improve also monarchic prerogatives, etc. But it was always a system that derived not from you know the king having the upper hand and easily you know decisively just demanding things, and that's another. And getting them. That's another bias we have towards the Middle Ages. We speak of absolutism in modern history, and uh, we're not even in there was you know fully mediated. But the true absolutism is the one we live now in, because you know from the Code Napoleon onwards, yes, okay, that's civil law, but factually also in countries of common law, you know, the state has a dramatic power. It's in uh, that, uh, you know, if these guys had seen a design, we would have seen, wow, this, that, this is hyper-tyranny. What was the state? What what they do that? Who has given them the power, right? And, and, and we blame the Middle Ages because it was tyrannic. Because of that, it wasn't like that, right? The Middle Ages, just so as we've seen a fundamentally a communitary imbalance of, of those who properly ruled or not, but this didn't properly embody in the monarchy, right? The monarchy, on the contrary, had usually played in favor of um, of the middle classes, usually, like also during the Roman Empire, right? You know, the, the, the main problem was the nobility here, that during the Middle Ages had sedimented a huge power that would take uh, centuries and, t and centuries up to the, 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 the end of the 8th, and between the end of the 8th and the beginning of the 20th century to basically... Uh, disappear and to, to, to get uh, juridical equality properly of all citizens at that point rather than subjects so um, no definitely we have always to check for every system why it was created why the balance existed and and especially judging I would say that's truly a civilizational uh, you know mm, thermometer we could say um, properly whether the system functioned or not because at the end of the day this thing served proper and had emerged for the, for that as we've seen non-progressive that is you know as a result of terrible problems uh, a reason to to effect to actually rule to 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 make societies work right to have a government that protects the people that you know that, that brings some order and that establishes those favorable condition for any civilization to, to happen in the first place, right? So if you, you know, dislike this thing, that you, you must have some civic problem because, you know, the freer doesn't mean better historically, most of the times, actually. It's more liberty that, in this sense, in this social contract view of the thing, where it's always mitigated that things happen. Otherwise, you have just, you know, tribes, people that kill each other, from 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 morning to to to, to night, uh, on a regular basis, trying desperately to 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 treasure to to to, to spare something, you know, out of this ruin of a, 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 a of, of a lifestyle that brings ages for for starting to develop something to to be properly being worth called a civilization, which is exactly what the Middle Ages did, right? Compared to you know tribal world. Even about the uh, broader changes, for example, the one of, you know, uh, th this considered that th this world was changing ever more speedily, right? Uh, this world uh, was seeing uh, an acceleration, definitely, of the state-building process. So what was the nobility doing, for example? What, what role did they have? What about the other classes that were going on around it? Um, uh, we're doing this regard. Uh, for example, how much did the nobility properly play in the politics of their their respective uh, their respective countries, and how much did these rising monarchies depend on their uh, use and their support? Right. So we can't generalize on this either. Right. And consider that here we're talking about a broader time of crisis. Uh, for example, of aristocracy uh, at a certain uh, level, for example, the one of orga uh, the organization and properly the fighting of war, right? That is a bit, even in here, um, you know, it's fair, it's correct, but still rem remind that it doesn't matter how, you know, 
uh, how strong cavalry was or whatever, you know, still the nobility would tighten its grip on society at this point. It was just becoming ever more elite within itself. This is true, right? And generally speaking, these no noblemen were fitting ever more, you know, statal functions, right? That's broadly towards even the, the second modern age, the trend, right? But nobility is nobility. Right, there are new figures emerging, but fundamentally these guys are still in charge. So thinking that nobility and the this terrible feudal medieval times came to an end because there were pikes and, and arquebuses it is a myth. The nobility was in charge all the time and it controlled this you know, with a degree of power that had never achieved before uh, in terms of properly of, of class uh, con you know, um, superiority. Right, It doesn't matter whether there were ever less but they were ever more powerful. And this is the dynamic of it. That is often mistaken by, you know, more infantry equa equals more, more, you know, democracy. Less, you know, are, are you kidding me? The, the Renaissance was, you know, was basically just uh, salaried pro proletarians under, you know, d d d princely control that were the ones that provided them with weapons and things and like, you know, there was nothing democratic, there's nothing coming from the below in this process by any stretch of the imagination, right? The fact that this system was improving altogether, also in the living conditions, is because it was managed by the elites that were investing and expanding and that made also the middle classes richer, etc. But the relative power of these classes was not greater right or at least even when it was it was because these classes had you know had a process of elitization for which yes people coming from uh, common commoners start becoming more important but just because they were commoners they were seen for the first time there but this process had happened because there were just a very few of them who could afford that because were were richer why did the majority of the other commoners had actually sunk in 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 uh, pol political prestige social prestige so don't think that this is a progressive reality under that point of view uh, you could question I don't know what is chivalry by the end of the middle ages right is it something real is it just for entertainment of court or public uh, definitely not right uh, but you know there are surely uh, definitely men who were making their fortune or reputation in, in, in other ways, in trade, for example. I mean, think about, you know, non-nobility that becomes royalty, like think, think about the medicine in Italy, uh, with, you know, banks and, you know, an overwhelming amount of, 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 of wealth that, that uh, you know, was literally at a royal level. Uh, the courts of law, um, the, you know, there were other means, social promotion, um, and uh, that that began to build some kind of, uh, not alternative, but still a challenge to the military nobility that had to retain, uh, you know, that wanted to retain its prerogatives. And was we were talking about it uh, the other day. Well, it's about the 18th century, with the French officer's appointment, the struggle with the bourgeoisie, etc. But that's, uh, you know, naturally much more advanced statal, statual reality that... Uh, doesn't properly reflect um, the uh, you know what we're seeing today, and still at that time the nobility was fundamentally in charge, still the petty nobility, as such. While there was an ultra elite of nobility that was uh, you know uh, that was truly tied to the monarchy at that point, and that and just in France, by the way, and some bourgeois that sometimes were becoming as rich as the petty nobility, but still. Uh, the situation was pretty obviously not uh, like, you know, the end of aristocratic power. <laughs> there, there would be a revolution at the end of the century to actually put an end to that. Because, um, So, what is, uh, of course, even there, the balances had changed, like the odds had changed, but still, um, there was an effective power f for the others to resist, to make a lock and to, you know, to leave the others out. And therefore, surely the nobility was changing, uh, properly in customs, in habits, etc. But um, we're still talking about it. Um, uh, religion at this point was tending to uh, emphasize uh, 
the uh, the the lay uh, the lay role in the church, right? Properly, there were some phenomena of um, faith, of, you know, of spiritual experience, uh, personal customization that properly came from the church. The church did still an astonishing amount of work actually to for for education for uh, for you know social organization um you know assistance you know, all these things um the the institutional church and the clergy was were surely losing ground at this point were st- were still dramatically important um and the the idea was that of course the church's sacramental life and teaching was you know gradually declining in perspective um and uh, in this sense it's not properly heresy that prevailed but simply uh, other manifestations properly religious um you know legitimacy we could could say you know, relatively to the role of of the clergy and uh, the relation with uh, with the, the, the roman church of the various national uh churches um so it's a comp- complex um, issue to to be concise about uh, here. Um, surely, though, um, the there was, as we we're remembering here, a, a great cultural influence still of, of the church, emphasizing piety, charity, uh, penance, self-denial, prayer to the Virgin, to the saints, uh, the growing appreciation by the individual of the incarnation of God made men in the person of Christ, um, whose life, passion, and death, if you also just know the, the beautiful art of the times, one of the, you know, the, the, some of the greatest masterpieces in the history of human civilization were produced right at this time, some of the greatest artists. Uh, well, you know, they were properly a, a fecund source of devotional inspiration, right? Uh, artistry here was also patronized, right? So there was a huge private interest also to you know to to fit that that role to, to have the you know to extend their clientele through uh, religious practice through devotion piety and this you know allegiance to, to 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 the church whether the roman one or the local ones that was very political uh, in nature na- you know internally or also internationally um their there was a, a great deal of manuscript work at this time, but also by the end of the century, very famously, uh, print made uh, gave a great boost to the spread of uh, prayer books, for example, accessible to to even uh, you know the uh, the the less uh, you know uh, to, let's say because the 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 people together were becoming more literate and better educated as lay, right? So. Uh, properly, the, we have seen um, th- that video on um, on the on the early press, etc. How um, the properly the market, like the needs, uh, the need to uh, to mechanize uh, hand uh, manuscript uh, books production, say better, in fact, more properly, came properly from this greater uh, need, right? This more spread need of greater spread of literacy albeit in that moment specifically in germany whatever it was still about you know certain confraternities public readings things like that but still right people were ever more interested in properly christian education were autonomously searching for it and wanted to confirm it right so this is a very important part of, of you know properly of, of european culture altogether it is not um, you know when these people could read something else uh, or you know they could read it in the first place they would still read fundamentally a religious stuff right and, and there was an autonomous but because people believed in that they it it was useful was purposeful properly for for the world of the time to be religious to believe in god it, it was an important element of political and social gluing that Maybe today we don't understand anymore because, in fact, we don't live in those times. But that are that is still, you know, very well known, even just at a you know psychological level and anthropological level. That, that we did de- we do need this uh, idea of, of 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 this unitary idea of of how the the universe works and the moral values, etc. And it, it's it's no 
there is no way out of that. If you, if you lack that, you have properly serious problem as, as, a, as an ethical being, right? Either you substitute it with something else, with a method or something, but um, it can't be just that. And there is a lot of moral d disorientation today, properly because we haven't, and probably there is no way out of you know religion to to find something similar to that because um, it, it stems from nosological limits of knowledge, right? It's not even a um, you know, properly a question of what contents in terms of which... It's also, well, differences in religions are important, but generally monotheism is the product of a very advanced civilizations, not, uh, you know, silly superstitious belief. And aside from this, um, the movement towards giving the laity a greater role in the church affairs uh, was definitely there much before the Reformation occurred, like at least one century, right? It, uh, in, you know, its roots are also not uh, 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 recent uh, in general. Uh, they, they belong a bit to the broader Christian uh, history of, you know, of, of, of thought, etc., and um, surely these factors were possible. Also, we should see that, you know, there was a ever better, more educated lay people at this time, right? Which doesn't mean still that they were, you know, the people at large at all, right? Look at what it was, you know, the West at the beginning of the 20th century. <laughs> you can't perfectly understand com comparatively what this meant by the 15th century, just to stress, as before, that this, there wasn't just any progressive and magnificent, uh, uh, you know, destiny of how it should evolve. No, it was something very gradual and, got by own standards of education, quite ridiculous, right, in comparison. It's still extremely and radically important for the time beings and for the history of civilization altogether. Um, there was a, 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 an evident increase in the number of educational institutions, for example, schools, uh, universities, uh, that were ever, uh, you know, closer to the uh, layman's growing role, at least in society. These were properly designed to the, to comfort these needs of education and, you know, of social promotion and and uh, skill, learning, etc. for the late. Um, there were urban schools and charitable foundations that helped, for example, to form young people. Um, there were also more opportunities for the educated to make careers outside the church. Mm -hmm. and so we've seen it with the process, same process of state building, of a broader dynamic of expansion now. Also, this is uh, the Europe is expanding literally, even if it's, gain, it's losing ground uh, in the Balkans, in the East in general. Um, but uh, fundamentally, uh, the, this is the age of exploration that has already started since the previous century, and, you know, who knows properly when uh, before. Um, there are other markets. Uh, Europeans are ever more connected, not just with each other, but with the rest of the world. Um, so uh, there is properly more need to know and knowing how to do and be uh, being aware about the world at the time. Um, numerous new universities, um, such as Oxford or Cambridge, just to, main, to name some, but uh, also new colleges and other foundations, had the general purpose, uh, were founded with general purpose not only to enhance the honor of God and the defense of faith, Right, because always remember this was central. Right, very often there was some episcopal, uh, insp inspirational example that was at the base of the specific foundations, but also um, to help in the advancement was was you know starting being idealized, not in a very you know uh, circumscribed fashion, but still you know the good and the profit of the public thing. Um, and uh, this can be observed at different levels in society. And surely, uh, also the, the the governmental need for for an educated class is ever more felt. Right, uh, this is a moment of gradual centralization. Properly, you need bureaucrats, you need administrators, you need uh, engineer, you need people who, who also come from the world because. Um, also, education, here we can't digress, but um, 
education here, these centers were not the, uh, they were just the tip of the iceberg, let's say. All the great uh, geniuses of this time, think about Leonardo, think about, uh, or also artists, right, uh, slash engineers, you know, they were polymaths fundamentally, they were scientists, uh, engineers, artists, um, uh, everything, right? Even men of letter, broadly meant. Um, they were like that because they had been able to educate them themselves also through theory and practice of life, right? Behind, uh, I don't know, we've seen it in military engineering. We often don't know who were these people, these masters, etc. But we know that since the low middle ages had acquired ever more important, and, and we know that even though it's not documented because this is an ever more humanistic, hence elitistic world that cares just about the theory and not much about the practice after roll to enucleate um in a there was a a, a a sub you know an underworld of practice of properly of work of technicians of, of of mechanicians that that were working like crazy and ever more in this war just look we have seen it in the history of warfare how larger more demanding armies were in logistically etc the People work behind these things, and we 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 are not very documented about it. We we just know about the most successful people that eventually maybe wrote something else. But still, there was a, a know-how that we kind of even lost, and um, that still by this time we don't frankly know what it consisted in. Well, it, we can't guess, but you know, it's uh, we we don't like we don't have a video of them doing stuff, right? So um, much knowledge was still. The I mean, most knowledge was still kind of um, mnemonic, oral, right? You know, still by, the, the, I don't know, the end of the 17th century, the great, I don't know, Dutch Navy was built by uh, shipmasters that fundamentally didn't write anything about that. They just were used to do that from centuries and centuries. They, they do it with excellent works, right? But still, uh, you know... Peter the Great of Russia who went there to learn had just to start working with them because there was probably nothing written to learn. He he would have gone to Venice when he would have found actually a lot of manuals there if, if you know affairs in Russia had you know made him come back uh, hastily. But d d this is just to show you how much also aside from the Renaissance elitism of 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 literature etc. Uh, reality, there, there is a huge reality behind this that we still don't know and that instead was making this world work. And it was an ever more lay reality, right? Uh, developments uh, culturally in this sense would be evident, especially in the early modern age in some countries that were advocating also more em emancipation from ecclesiastical education. It is particularly evident in England, in the Netherlands. Sometimes also in, in Venice that was considered, for that reason, you see, culturally, not religiously, an honorary Protestant by the, the Northerners because uh, it kept the Inquisition out, right? It was still more, you know, scientifically thriving than other Catholic centers. Um, so, yeah, these are very important dynamics not to ever uh, forget. Um, printing, we were talking about it before. Um from the second half of the century it appeared in Europe, right? And uh, it was, it is considered rightfully in history one of the greatest, uh, you know, and long lasting um, accomplishments, advancements made in 15th century Europe. If not the greatest, maybe of that century specifically, but it's not um, entirely judgeable in this sense. Um, at the time, though, even here, the, the, progr the, the, the change was, was, uh, was gradual. Right, uh, not everybody was convinced about the advantages, the the benefits uh, of printing itself, and even here the reasons were political. Right, uh, of course um, there was um, you know some scholarly resistance, but even in here, education was greatly uh, enhanced uh, because of printing and the availability properly of simply people that were more educated, that read more, that could more cheaply get it i mean more not cheaply but more conveniently get educated um and this started also because of of controversy right uh scholars uh or simply people with some some prestige of authority began to argue their their opinions in forms that 
up to previous times were, were not even properly possible to have, not because somebody was preventing that from happening, but simply because they didn't have the, the material means to do it before the printing, right? Um, and this was seized uh, as an opportunity immediately by the princely courts. Why? Because fundamentally, uh, more division uh, allows you know to side you know one or the other uh, community faction, whatever you want to call it, to and to play more in this equilibrium. So if you want to also distract people in this regard and or ride the wave of certain you know ideas that are spreading. Fundamentally, the Reformation happened like this. It's not that. You know, sovereigns had a more or less of a you know, of a taste of you know for for Catholicism or not. It's just that they they saw this opportunity most of the times to as a you know as a way to to centralize to cash the the, the church proper to all these things. And so uh, there is a public opinion that is being born gradually, also thanks to the to the press. Um, uh, Laws also here there is a great deal of juridical science development and properly production and commentaries and debate etc. Uh, also on a larger scale, properly Europe here in the Renaissance is a true Europe in the sense that it's united. People come from every country uh, to properly tell their own story. There is a revival, as you know, of, of, of classicism. There are ever more scholars who properly know how to actually speak and write in Latin, which is something that you don't have to think in the Middle Ages had actually happened, right? People understood Latin, but we know from ecclesiastical organization you know, that that was not enough for people coming from, I don't know, Germany or Spain or France or Italy to properly understand each other um, just through Latin. Uh, the good Renaissance, the good humanism, properly creates a European common language, so much that we just also try with this international exchange problems at university as after Erasmus and this great uh, properly of European wide culture, right? There is nothing, there's something hardly more Euro, uh, more European than, than, than literary Renaissance, right? The idea that properly Europe was moving as a set of different peoples that however um, dialogue now as one in a true connection. For most of the Middle Ages, I would say certain areas of Europe had remained if you want, far away, right? Aside from, you know, the most advanced areas like Italy or Flanders, etc., where there you know, was a greater dynamism, uh, you know, more equal distribution and higher dis uh, amount of wealth per capita and so on. Uh, you know, areas like, I don't know, did, I don't know, Spain and Sweden dialogue that much? <laughs> you know, England or or, or Austria dialogue that much, you know, th th there, is, uh, there is something that is brought together in the compactness of it. There are many other factors. There are, there are the Ottoman invasions, for example, that properly create a, our narrow concept of Western Europe properly. Like, if, if the Ottomans hadn't existed in that regard, we wouldn't properly have an idea of what Western European means today. Um, and... And and even in there, there, there is a greater reflection, universal. If you want, there are also there is also coming back uh, of certain universalist instances that were connected also properly to the reformation of the church, the centrality of man and his, his intellect, and in, you know, in a humanistic, in fact, sense, the, the as we've seen the widening properly of the continents' horizons with the explorations, um, this uh, the the Ottoman threat. Uh, so to enucleate a European view that during the Middle Ages, as you know, had taken really a long while before taking off as such. And however, printing helped, right? Uh, Erasmus was not the only one taking up the chance. Um, and uh, the debates uh, in the 16th century, you see, the Reformation itself might have, you know, been different and also with a different outcome if the press had not developed, right? After all, especially in the early phase, um, you know, the Catholic-Protestant uh, divergence could be re... Uh, there was nothing deterministic about, properly, the, the Reformation proper. It could have been uh, recomposed. Um, looking at a broader landscape of uh, economy, you could say production, etc., well, uh, still, 
as we've seen, we're we're looking at pre-industrial systems with an overwhelmingly agricultural, uh, you know, based uh, economy, right? Uh, trade is important, but it doesn't have the the, sta- uh, the the same flow it had had towards the, the 13th century, but proportionally, um, the um, yeah, we're we're looking properly at the, the concentration of greater wealth in the hands of fewer people, but not the same amount of wealth. Europe would take couple two or three centuries to properly recover fully from it but also properly from a demographic point of view um, s- still the system was episodically affected by famine and even more by war right war surely you know the 15th century was one of harsh um, conflicts and military escalations and yet the system uh, especially in terms of trade, seems not to have been particularly affected by this. By the 15th century, uh, because of the... You see, after the crisis, we've seen that land had acquired greater value on the market than before. People came to invest more in territorial assets. This is true also for the greater powers altogether. So there is this idea that um, European wealth, also in the face of, think about the the Ottoman onslaught in the Balkans, in Hungary, etc., you know, that, that, that this fragmentation, this based on different centers of, of power, um, not in a, in a huge uh, unitary empire like, I don't know, in China or... You know, even in systems as it had been before, had uh, helped to you know capitalistically save uh, and to manage properly better um, it, wealth, uh, treasure, to forms also of uh, transactions, etc. In in these various systems, naturally there was a, a huge deal of internationality in here, like it was never lost, especially at the banking level, uh, as we were recalling before. But this system helped to properly invest rapidly and differently and to diversify properly investment in the most, uh, you know, it's still a very unstable and floating uh, economy, but still with, with a much greater degree of, uh, of facility, of ease, than in properly refined means of accounting, of banking, etc. In, in this regard. Um, this was very important properly for these new monarchies and principalities to secure certain assets, right, properly certain powers were depending on specific banks, think about the role of the Fuca or uh, the Genoese uh, St. George Bank um, for the Habsburgs uh, so that uh, even in here this was a, a mean, uh, it was a negotiation it was a mean of social promotion uh, the Fuca were subcontracted certain, you know, certain mines to, you know, to cash from those uh, they went bankrupt anyway, right, but still uh, there was a way to tie these assets ever more to to the political institutional destinies um, in, in a sense Um and, and and crisis does help to properly refine the system to 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 in, to spot the the safest investments right uh, the the great crack of the mid 14th century was due in part also to the relative lack of safeguard measures in the sense that the medieval civilization had literally boomed and then eventually contract all of a sudden and the, the thing was so fast that it was ruinous because nobody had kind of even expected this enormous uh, rates of growth to ev- to eventually drop, right? Instead, now growth existed, but it was more orderly, more channeled, more you know, uh, managed, mediated, etc. And so this facilitated, you know, provided more stability in relative terms to the system. Um, it this phase, how, uh, you know, th- this dynamic, however, went in parallel with uh, an ever greater exploitation of rural communities as we were saying before when we look at the laity that emerges right you know it emerges where in the courts uh, in the cities right so in the centers that fundamentally ruled this overwhelming amount of you know majority of people that lived in the countryside that basically had lost an enormous deal of their previous liberty you know, since the previous centuries that had uh, somewhat also brutally repressed that fundamentally had been uh, controlled by ever more powerful lords, right? And they had lost everything in 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 the broader match, right? They 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 lost ruinously, um, and these people were somewhat uh, they were ever more exploited, thus, 
right? The, the, the contractual power of landlords was much greater than before. So as a consequence, um, it's fair to say that the rural communities that still, of course, maintained the world system were ever more detached communitarily from the centers of power, right? The, the city patriciates, the courts, uh, and their uh, entourage were ever more kind of close to each other. Um, and this is easy to see um, when, for example, confrontating in Renaissance culture, um, the, for example, the refined patrician ways, I don't know, of Italy that were imitated by, I don't know, the, all the great feudal courts, right? Think about France, uh, where they were obsessed about Italy that they considered as oh, almost as an appendix of France to be conquered uh, at the um, uh, new radio <laughs> newest radio opportunity. Um, and that spread of, of course, Italy as, you know, the, the, the producing the properly European modern culture as such, you know, being this source of, um, of properly of public culture, of science, of basically every field of knowledge that would serve those same, um, you know, think about Leonardo that died in, in France, right under the service of Francis I. I mean, it, that is what these people wanted. The, the best searches for the best, right? The other people are brutally exploited in this regard, right? And the, the patriciate feudalizes, in a sense, even in lifestyle, whereas the fe feudality um, uh, becomes ever more, you know, uh, I could say commoner or democrat, no, but, you know, its uh, lifestyle was also more more gentrified than the, the, the rude military one that had been before, ideally, right? There is this uh, search for tastes, for refinement, and so on. And so the elites blend in, together, dynastically, culturally, uh, etc. And this also contributes to create uh, internationally a greater cooperation at certain levels. I mean, certain military developments wouldn't be understandable if you don't read, pro if you don't look properly at the, um, the way diplomacy here starts working, right, in an ever more professional, permanent base that evaluates all, uh, as we were saying before, ever more the risk factors and all, uh, all this stuff. Um, there is a process of general economical revival, seemingly uh, in the second um, half of the century, right, it's being spotted, there is, um, you know, enough consensus about this, that economy began to revive uh, towards from the mid-15th century onwards, also because of, you know, um, of the objective stabilization of some realities, that is to say, in spite of the Ottoman invasions in the Balkans, um, but, you know, in the West there was the, the end of the Hundred Years' War, um, there was, if you want, also in Germany, the, 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 the rise of a more powerful, you know, entity such as the one of the Habsburgs in Spain, the Reconquista fundamentally, um, you know, uh, brought an end to 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 war at least on, on Iberian soil, uh, soil. Excuse me. Uh, the, Italy was marked famously enough by the the policy of equilibrium, right up to the end of the century. So this is a moment of great um, of stability. Europe also freaks out because of the fall of Constantinople, which is another thing in saying, okay, let's see what happens and let's try to to. You know, let's for a moment forget certain local problems and think of how to react to this broader thing, even though they didn't concretely do much, given the potential they had, but they surely were very careful now about things that could, would happen. There is also a sense of methods of stillness because of the recompaction of France, right? France now, after the Hundred Years' War, uh, re uh, retakes fundamentally that uh, imminent place that it had had in, in the 13th century as the, the major undiscussed major European power that, re, you know, that, that conquers also further land in the northeast, etc., and becomes, um, you know, object of, of, of worry for, for many uh, European countries that are trying to, you know, to, to make a common front. And that's also a bit of the history of, uh, you know, the, especially of the 17th century, as we've seen the Prince Eugene and the 1683 Vienna series, uh, because of the enormous demographic and agricultural resources of France, that is one together all again. Uh, England a little bit with Rose, fundamentally in itself. Think about the Wars of the Roses and this moment of, you know, instability that would be, bring to an end with the rise of the Tudors that uh, will confer 
however, still a new unit. It actually, you know, famously enough, the Wars of the Roses and the, the, the decimation of the of the English nobility in the process brings to a it favors greatly a political compaction in England, right? Because there were less people to you know to share uh, people uh, power with, at least less uh, reference in that regard. Also, the Scandinavian monarchies acquire a, a better defined statual physiognomy. Think about the Kalmar Union and in spite of all its problems, but let's say, you know, that there is this idea that some, you know, uh, unity should be, you know, affirmed and maintained uh, in, for, for the sake of stability. Poland also acquires, especially after Grunwald uh, slash Tannenberg, the, um, you know, an important um, solidity after the personal uh, the, the unit with, 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 with Lithuania, right? So the, there is a compaction there, starts becoming a, a, a very solid entity at the expenses of the Teutonic Order. Um, yeah, the, on, the only area that gets fundamentally overrun is the Balkans. Also, Hungary were crumbled at the beginning of the 16th century. But and that's where, in fact, we were talking about Western Europe as, you know, a, a reaction to what the Ottomans properly did perceptionally, right? Uh, there is also a great development of uh, of Germany from an economical point of view. I mean, at the end of the Middle Ages, they reached they, they were the, the, basically the most technologically advanced country together with Italy. Um, the f- fragmentation in these in the lands of the empire, you see, the, the German and Italian states were, you know, it was is remarkable because they are fundamentally and they would remain for the modern age so-called weak areas, but they produced this astonishing cultural, you know achievements and still maintain a very important place in uh, you know in economy and in uh, quality standards of living and so on um, there are differences even in here so we are approximating but you know it, it, it's um, it's actually very important um, what else can we say uh, there is um, that not every place as we've seen is the same indeed uh, this uh, uh, e- economical uh, stability, um, increase of resources and wealth is mostly to be identified in the century's third quarter. Uh, France and Portugal uh, saw this happening more than other countries during these years. England, as we've seen, saw little change proper even during the period. Um, France, as we've seen, because of the, its territorial recompaction. Portugal, because it was pioneering the, uh, you know, the exploration of, of, of the Indies, and so on. Um, so, the decline in population since the previous century had naturally brought cities on the fore, as we've seen, because the, their elites had managed to extend uh, over, you know, a, proportionally over a larger amount of territory. Uh, in the, the and bring it into the economic orbit of the, the, the smaller settlements, uh, towns. Uh, international trade was a big deal, and especially Portugal uh, maritime trade was becoming ever more important. Properly in a trans, in, you know, in an inter- at an in, yeah transcontinental level, I don't know. Dynamics will start. They're famous also, especially. For to modernists like I don't know the Russian grain being exported to to, to the Barren Peninsula at this time or I mean you know uh, also the uh, starting about the, to, to have these transatlantic connections with the Americas um, and uh, so ports contribute and this in the development of international trade contributes to that divide that we have seen between cities and countryside uh, France is a good example because uh, as we've seen, that composite character of the country that still lived by different rights, by this different customs and traditions, was fundamentally uh, managed uh, with providing the, the main French cities with this role of um, intermediaries with the local territories, fundamentally. Um, cities would become, would even compete with each other to, to serve the king, to, 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 to receive um, some you know benefits, uh, and their their wealth in this sense was properly invested to pro- to to build to to contribute to that monarchical system. Also, in spite of the 
contraction of uh, Eastern Mediterranean trade because of the Turkish uh, advance, uh, the market of luxury goods remained strong, right, in Europe uh, witnessing uh, still high and actually rising standards of, of living, right, because that, you know, that was the, the way from which all basically most of the luxury products came from, at least as raw materials, etc., the Silk Road, uh, and so on. Um, cities had a main uh, socio-economical role to play, right? The most important ones were, you know, naturally and historically the Italian and the Flemish ones. They were just culturally, you know, predisposed to that as, as a vocation. Uh, they, cities were properly centers of education, providing it, right? Chiefly in the form of schools, but universities as well the guilds uh, acted as uh, artistic patrons also having this uh, imp more important connections with uh, with royalty with you know princes and so on the same guilds had fundamentally um, elitized we could say you know and uh, this is pretty evident i don't know think about florence where basically the medici managed to take over the whole guild system that had been traditionally let's say Co very composite, right? And instead, they rise as, as basically the sole dynasts in what was namely uh, a republic from the top of their banking power. Um, and think about the huge artistic patronage of, you know, 15th century Florence that is truly the, the, the cultural capital uh, of Europe. Um, the All the Renaissance humanistic achievements in there. Um, there is also a renewed historical interest. This is to be seen in Germany, and in particular also in, here in Italy, famously enough. I mean, these great humanistic stories that are starting to be truly uh, uh, an enormous work of historical collection of, of philological uh, refinement, um, etc., that bring political prestige uh, to the patrons and also properly create a vision Right, an historiographical, in fact, vision perspective that we still, you know, from humanistic times, we still have um, largely, uh, even unfortunately, about certain prejudices about the previous times, about what they started calling as the Middle Ages at this point, but that there are extremely precious because there are uh, great works of properly of research that start properly a tradition in Europe that we could say has lived up to up to today in spirit um, there were um, important uh, there was also celebration probably of city identities to the communal entertainment such as festivals uh, and where you know the, the, the great magnates could sponsor the, their own prestige by investing by providing for power and this naturally shows basically the uh, the cities how they were ruled by an elite that fundamentally controlled the whole thing and provided for for everything for you know, also for entertainment etc um and uh, uh there you know there, there is a sense of 15th century sense of generalized um knightly chivalry think about the internationalization of tournament but also certain religious practices Right, and this great idea of touring and the, the, uh, Europe that was starting to know each other er, ever better, right? There's been a lot of international encounters in this regard. Um, early history of printing is naturally associated to cities. For example, by 1469, Venice had already become the adopted home of the German printer Johannes de Spira. Um, and uh, Venice would remain also with important local centers like Padua in its possessions, etc. You know, one of the great Renaissance capitals for, for centuries uh, to come. Commercial links here were very important. Venice was notoriously connected with southern Germany, with Bavaria, through land routes to where German communities in Venice. Um, and it was all part of the, the broader interests of the Habsburgs, for example, with the you know with the northern Italy and uh, the, the the you know the yeah central uh, Balkanic Europe. Um, all uh, uh, realities you see that are coming ever more dichotomically you know interdependent. Mm -hmm. And uh, surely 
these city centers were also probably a great place of gathering of sharing skills competences right and uh, properly know-how techniques technologies for the printers for the artists uh, for engineers and so on um, speaking of the military nobility as we were saying before um, lots have changed like the 15th century somewhat conceived as uh, you know the, the the sunset of of chivalry in uh, rightfully so right in the sense that cavalry would come back uh, traits in in, in, in in history of warfare due to certain reasons but fundamentally the knight right is something that with, especially with the emergence of the square uh, you know uh, the pike square uh, model pioneered by by the swiss which is professional which is properly statual right uh, ends right and by the mid 16th century cavalry as such is reduced to to a very poor thing on the battlefields also not to be overlooked anyway and it will regain importance in fact immediately afterwards but um it, yeah properly the idea of banally even of the knight in shiny arm right you know as which is not a few right all the technique of the full plate armor the, the 15th century is as you know the moment of which more uh, more more metal was on, on the field for for protection and this will end in the following century and there is a, a democratization of warfare if anything just in the fact that you know noblemen started dying much more easily right and therefore they truly needed to adapt to the military reality but still they, they maintain their preeminence as we've seen on the field because those same armies that could kill them were the product of elite of nobility or power that was able to pay them as well as we were saying before um, th there are new uh, there is a new addict spray, uh, spreading if you want also um, a neg negative tragicomic one think about uh, you know um, Cervantes or Ariosto as they would uh, depict this idea of fading chivalry in a, in a melancholic sense um, and th the new view of the soldier is an ambiguous one actually there is a lot of um, we made a video about this properly a lot of us are allegoric um, contempt towards war and the misery of it how it was criticized from even properly in a way of life entrepreneurially speaking the, there's a bit of humanistic hypocrisy behind it in the sense that of course the system was still fueled by these things as well and that you know it's not that before soldiers had a better life or that later they would have again right but um, there is at least a renewed interest and that is important humanistically um, towards properly the, the value of war for the Christian community for how where it should be addressed you know how properly that is what sh we should fight for that had always been a big deal but that in the renaissance now was being exposed in ever more crude realistic um you know ways think also in here about the, all the allegories of that still uh, europe ha was still shocked in a way by by the you know by thing by the plague that had struck since the the century before in an you know, unpreceded, unpreceded way um there is still a medieval mindset of course even in renaissance that still emerges fundamentally from this traditional substratum that will remain uh not everywhere uh, what is interesting militarily speaking is naturally the rise of uh certain technical figures technicians skilled in uh, military engineering specifically arms uh, fortifications guns uh, as such especially you know we are you know firearms uh, attract our attention by the early 16th century they would become definitely a, a must for any updated uh, army that could stand a chance on the field um, so naturally these people were very prized uh, they there was a competition between them that brought them to to the pursuing as uh, in the humanistic minds with they were more theorized the theoretical and you know functionalized and positive uh experience about uh about this this sciences these fields um so there was also a renewed attention towards artists proper as we've seen many artists were also military engineers or however people could you know built i don't know a cathedral as much as a 
as a castle, right? So, I don't know. Uh, Manetti at this point wrote uh, the uh, beautiful biography of Brunelleschi, that is uh, author naturally of the of the, the Florentine dome, uh, cathedral dome, and this genre of the lives of the artists. You see, it, it's it's something that mirrors that it becomes very popular here. Mirrors definitely the the prestige and and the uh, the importance that these figures had acquired, like many other laymen in this society, like even jurists, for example, has this uh, the word knighted proper, right? They were considered nobility, elite at very high levels. Um, so there was all a, an important market behind the artists um, in the uh, the properly the, the shops, the, the atelier. Uh, the places where people learned the artistic values and techniques, right? And um, historically, such literary works are very important because they reveal us properly a lot, starts at least to reveal a lot about that uh, hidden world that we were talking about before that do not, doesn't tell, uh, do not tell all, but, you know, uh, still are much uh, a great improvement to, to before. So uh, there is also a broader critical capacity uh, displayed properly by European civilization. Think about even, uh, still speaking about religion, the, the criticism to the church sometimes is, that is, uh, is something that the church accepted or even, you know, that, that it corrected itself. When we think about the false uh, Constantine's donation, that was this 8th and ninth century text that, you know, had uh, was fundamentally a bit the justificated, uh, yeah, legal. There was plenty of them, but this specific one had been um, created or at least adopted by the church because similarly it was done in France and it was plenty of those things in the four kings, etc. Um, had um, you know provided you know the, the church with this earthly power as well by by the Roman emperor and so on. Well, it was debunked by. Lorenzo Valla, that incidentally was a man working for the Pope, right? And uh, and uh, that was doing it for properly philologically spotting that that document was was false. Well, obviously it didn't date to Constantine's times, and uh, it was just a big made up, right? And, but the Church was capable of saying yes, this is exactly so, right? And the, the Church had the best humanists, had the best culture, had the best libraries, had the best you know tradition in this regard. Um, if you know Florence is uh, the 15th century cultural capital, definitely 16th century, especially the early 16th century papal Rome is uh, in its own regard uh, for the Renaissance. So it, it, it it's a you know to our standards, like if you've never heard about these things, for example, like it can't say, it can't sound strange as a as an historical <laughs> interpretation. I give you that, right? And I like to make it sound so because I want to provoke. Uh, thinking, and um, and yes, uh, yet this is at least known to anybody who has studied this. The period it's a it's a controversial moment, right? It's a moment of tensions. It's a moment of you know, of not great serenity, right? The 16th century would specifically would be uh, possibly the single most traumatic century in in Western history. There's not properly even the 20th century has been shocked so much by things like world wars, the Holocaust, etc., as much as the, the 16th century was shot purely traumatized by the Reformation. Like about the Americas discovering new worlds, yes, too, like a bit disoriented, but you know it's nothing in comparison of the breaking of the church unity. But also the 15th century was dark, right? You can see it in. Um, you know, it's beautiful in many ways. Uh, art is fantastic there, but also, if, if you understand, it's loaded. It's heavy sometimes. Too, it's, you know, uh, you can feel the, the burden sometimes of, and it's still this broader look and existential life and, you know, uh, the passion of the Christ, the blood, the, you know, the death, the, you know, the, um, in, in this sense of sufferance, uh, this is typical also of specifically of certain countries in Europe, more in the eastern side, um, called for, for certain reasons that are, but, but properly are, you know, it, it's still a, a heavy moment, right? Don't don't think this is the, the the progressive exit of the Middle Ages where everybody was starting being happier, etc. Things were improving, but the world was becoming ever more complex and agitated, 
in a sense. It's a bit today, right? Today we live in a better moment than than before, but still, a lot of bad things happen in general. Still, and the the moral tendencies to feel like this these are bad times fundamentally, right? You know, it, this happens a bit in every time, but certain ones are perceived as more stable than others. Like up to 20 years before, it wasn't like that. Uh, all right, well, for today, we stop it here. Uh, we will keep talking about the 15th century in this broader perspective, which I find fascinating, telling the truth. Because also, and I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know much about the 15th century, right? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I never, it never happened me to study it, never find it particularly, I mean to study it in detail, right, or particularly you know it's always been antipathetic to me, it was like a bit the, the 14th century before I, I decided randomly to make a PhD on it right, so the 15th century, I presume it's as beautiful, you know, possibly even more right, and it's very it's very popular in certain regards, like the f 15th century English perspective of the world is basically the 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 one we think the Middle Ages through in the West, like on uh, the filter we use to the on average, like it's like I don't know, the Game of Thrones thing, and and that's not just it, right? As we've seen, every country is different here, uh, in these uh, in this analysis, but also it's uh, you know the the the, the things were very varied properly also over time and still similar at certain other levels and uh, anyhow well okay we'll stop this digression too for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.